Now, friends, we're going to play you an old breakdown, the kind that you can just roll up the rug, move back the chairs, and turn on. You know, one of the old deep in the heart of Texas tunes. Here it is. Let's go, boys. A breakdown. <laughs> You know, I've played with a lot of bands, but no matter where you go after you play with Bob Wills, that's who people are going to associate you with, which I'm not a bit ashamed of. He had a magic on, on the stage. He was just had more charisma than anybody I'd ever seen. And so this night in Waco, uh, he says, uh, tells the crowd, there's a little fiddle player here that I understand is uh, going to work with us. He said that. The band boys hired him, and they said he's good. Well, he had better be. <laughs> well, don't be ashamed of your age. Don't let the years get you down. That old gang you knew. They still think of you as a rounder in your old hometown. Don't mind the gray in your hair. Just think of all the fun you had putting it there. As for that old book of time, you've never skipped a page. Don't be ashamed of your age, brother. Don't be ashamed of your age. These guys are not ashamed of their age, and I isn't either. I was born in 1926 in Tyler, Texas, and then uh, we lived six miles east of Tyler, a little community called Bascom. The first live music I remember hearing was Uncle John Gimble playing the little eight-string mandolin, sitting out on the porch playing Washington and Lee Swing. Uncle Paul Gamble did keep a fiddle and a handling, and, and when we used to go out in the summertime and spend a week with him and help with the crops, we'd get him to fiddle for us. And he played just unaccompanied. He'd do Bully of the Town. Do you hear that rhythm lick in there? I didn't uh, start playing until uh, what? Well, we I was about 10 years old, I guess, 36. And we went over there to, to Lindale and saw Huggins Williams was his name and found out, found out later that he had recorded with a group called East Texas Serenaders. And he taught us how to play Beaumont Rag and how to do that. You know how all the guys do this old shuffle bow? <laughs> you know that, yeah. that Jesse Ashlock did so yeah. much? Well, Lefty was the first guy we'd ever seen to do it. Maybe we'd heard it on a record or something. No, we didn't have a record player. But I couldn't figure out how he was doing it, and he's left-handed to make it more complicated. <laughs> so we got home one night, and old uh, Gene, my brother, a year older than me, says, I saw how he did that. <clears throat> what he did was watch his, the end of his bow was making a circle like this, and almost, almost a circle, and then going back. And he said, that's the way you did. I don't know how you... And you know, watch it when you do it.
had this little old band, the Rose City Swingsters, back in 39 and 40, we were still learning every day, and we'd listen from radio bands. Our favorite program was the Light Crest Doughboys, who were on uh, five days a week at 12.30 noon. They had one of the best banjo players in the world, Marvin Smokey Montgomery. I joined the Doughboys in 1935, and we'd buy all the records we could find of, of music out of New Orleans, Dixieland music. And we'd buy, if we heard a record that had any kind of guitar player, like the Ink Spots. The first record I ever bought with a guitar player on it was the Ink Spots. And we'd copy note for note what he was playing for, and learn the licks that way. And then we listened to uh, Mexican music, like the Cucaracha and Rancho Grande and all those things. And we'd play Five Foot Two, Eyes Up Bloom, all the popular songs of Penny Goodman, those guys were playing. In those days, we played the best we knew how, every, all, every time. They say, take a course, we played every lick we ever knew and went out and learned a few ones on Saturday nights or sometime when we were off, we'd go down on Deep Elm and listen to the colored people play the guitars and sing them. We'd take our instruments and set in with them. And if they were the right kind of blues, we'd sing them on the air. And we made records that we couldn't play on the air. It had funny titles like, You Got What I Want, Pussy, 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 and she, She's Gonna Give It To Me Tomorrow. Stuff like that, which we couldn't use on the air then. Of course, you can use everything on the air now. Here's Billy Dozier with the Milk Cow Blues. When I woke up in I suppose the first time I heard Bill Boyd's band was their radio programs on WRR in Dallas. Later on, I found out that Jim Boyd was playing bass with him and played guitar some, and I always really enjoyed him, and so when I got a chance to do this album I'm making, I thought it'd be appropriate to have Jim pick guitar on it. I lost my pick already. Brother Bill started the Cowboy Ramblers uh, somewhere in 1932. And Run of the Double Eagle was the first tune that uh, we recorded on RCA Victor there in 1934. And as Jim Boyd says, if you can play on the double eagle on the guitar and Wildwood Flyer, you can make a living. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the first time I heard Cliff Bruner was when I was 13 or 14 years old. He had some records that had more life to them than any I've ever heard and still are my favorites. I finally got to hear him in person and finally got to play some shows with him when I was 17 years old in 1943. And uh, he took time out to teach me some licks on the fiddle and, uh, and I'm still learning from him. But one of my favorite records of all time was his version of Dragging the Boat. He had a steel guitar that was hotter than a pistol. Bob Dunn was the, uh, the guy that just invented the steel guitar. 
played with Milton Brown on the, the only steel player on Milton's records, and then with Cliff Brunner and a hundred others. There's, this is Cliff. <laughs> Back in those days, it was the hard times when we was a bunch of kids just going from one town to the other trying to seek our fortune, you know. We knew it was better than picking cotton. We just started from scratch and had to originate most of our styles back in those days. We didn't uh, know cards, we didn't know anything. We just had to do it the hard way. I played a few breakdowns, but that wasn't my cup of tea. I, I like swing music. Since I was a kid, I started improvising, and uh, I, it's just uh, bred into you, I guess. <laughs> I didn't really get crazy about Bob Wills until about 1940. His early records didn't really have the jazz feel like they did later on. Eldon Shamblin began to have a hand in arranging and, and teaching the guys harmony and things. I think he caught everybody's ear then as a jazz or a modern guitar player and uh, taught everybody a lot about life. He's got the best attitude. Actually, he wasn't a Texas uh, player. He's from Oklahoma, but he joined Bob in 38, I think. I was a staff musician at the CBS station in Tulsa in 1937 when Bob offered me a job. At that time, he was just starting to build a good band. I done an awful lot of the arranging for Bob through the World War II. My thing back in those days were the big bands, the hotel bands, when I was a very young man. Can you imagine picking cotton and hearing that? 1940? We could we could hire men from them. Yeah, right. That's it. So uh, some of some of these bands were making more money than the yeah, big we, band. That's right. We're making more money where we was yeah. than if we'd have been with Benny Goodman. During the last months of the war, after Bob got out of the army and he reorganized his band, he came out with a record that just knocked me out called "Hang Your Head in Shame." I heard that record and uh, I was ready to ship out and go overseas in 1945 and it just, I couldn't stand it, it sounded so good. you just laugh and cry, you know. And all the time I was overseas, I was just aching to hear that music again. And then when I came home in 46, year and a half later, I got to see him in person. And it was as good a music as there's ever been or ever will be. Oh, John, oh, 
don't fool around, grab your pint and truck on down. Ida Red, Ida Red, I'm plum fool about Ida Red. Now, Joe! Find the great clock on the mantel to this, it's getting late. The curtains on the window, snow it white. The parlor is playing on Sunday night. I'd a red, I'd a red, I'm plum fool about I'd a red. On the wall, that's for the sofa, and that's not all. If I'm not mistaken, I'm sure I'm right. There's somebody else in parlor tonight. I'd a red, I'd a red, I'm plum fool about I'd a red. This band was everybody's hero. Like I said, in 1948, I saw a jukebox that held 20 records, and 12 of them was, uh, was Bob Wills. <laughs> Tommy Duncan. So in 49, whenever uh, they approached me, I was playing in Corpus Christi with a little dance band called the Rhythm Airs. Uh, we had a little five-piece band, and uh, they played the club where we were working, and Tiny Moore came over to me and says, uh, uh, we were playing when they came in, you know, to set up, and Tiny said, uh, would you like, you think you'd like to work with Bob Wills? Well, it's like saying, would you like to go to heaven, you know? And it was a thrill of my life to go with this band. It'd be like, Going with the New York Yankees if you're a ball player. Roly poly, eats a hearty dinner. It takes lots of strength to run and play. Yes, yes. When I went on the band, I asked uh, Tiny Moore, they have an expression in the studio, how do you want us to act? You know, I said, what does Bob expect of you? And he said, well, let me tell you a little story. He said, tonight, soon after I joined the band, he said, Bob was playing one of his old fiddle tunes, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star or something. And Bob whirled around and pointed that bow for me to play, and Tiny said, uh, I played the straight lead. And uh, Bob uh, gave somebody else a solo following Tiny, and he eased over to him and said, Son, when I point at you, I want you to play all you know. It seemed like that the bands built, you know, we were listening from 35, 38, and the, and the 40s, they really began to get sophisticated with, uh, with Spade Cooley on the coast using three synchronized fiddles. Great, clean stuff, but it got to where every band in the country sounded like that. And uh, I think what happened is uh, Hank Williams came along in 51, 52. And although uh, to me it felt like he was setting music back 20 years, it was fresh again, see. And then really the death of what we call Western Swing was in 1955 when Elvis Presley started recording and he was so different that it just sort of turned around. When I left Bob Wills' band, I would barber as a sideline when things get slow in the music business, and then later on, I barbered full time and just played weekends. But in 1968, I finally got up enough nerve to move the family to Nashville and try to make it as a studio musician. The people in Nashville were real nice and we made a real good living, but it never did really feel like home, and Texas feels like home. And I don't see any point in dying and going to Texas, you might say. I'm getting to play what I like to play, 
and uh, it might not make as much money as it does from Hee Haw, but it sure is a lot of fun. I want to remind the people, too, when they come into Seven Bar Western Wear today to register for all the merchandise to be given away that you'll be drawing for on the 20th. You mean Johnny Gibble and free merchandise? How about Maurice Anderson, still guitar? In my thing. I don't know what I miss the most. The mountains out west or the southern coast are just being where a fella can see for miles and miles. The East Texas hills and the tall pine trees, the level land with the prairie breeze. Maybe I'm lonesome just to see a Texas smile. Right now, I wish I was sitting right under the X in Texas. Right in the heart where my heart must be. No matter where I roam, I never feel at home except in Texas. Right under the X in Texas is where I like to be. is where it's best for me. I, I believe that there's a, there's a young generation is turning on to what is called Western Swing. The, you know, Sleep at the Wheel did their first album, I suppose, in 72 or 73, and where Merle Haggard had done a tribute album and used some of us from Bob's band on it, and create a lot of interest right at the height when, when uh, Merle had just won the Entertainer of the Year thing, and so he got a lot of attention to it. And uh, Sleep at the Wheel didn't take me back to Tulsa, and they did some of Bob's, uh, some other of Bob Will's tunes, and they did the Moon Mulligan songs. And they're also doing uh, Count Basie and Louis Jordan, which is also, when you do it on strings, it's Western Swing to me. Big sucks a blossom yeah. while the big bee gets a honey. Poor man raises cotton, what rich man gets the money. Take me back to Tulsa, I'm too young to marry. Take me back to Tulsa, I'm too young to marry. Oh, Paul, yeah. Take me back right now, I can't stand no more. down to the railroad tracks and they went down to meet her she pulled out a hexa and i pulled out for tulsa cut what cut what cut 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 i like it i can't i like it i like okay let's get but seriously folks god what a what are you risk. asking oh what attracted me to western swing seriously uh me the fiddles and the steel guitars and the blues. <laughs> Excuse me, man. Yeah, you know, all the weirdness, the jazz and the blues. You know, all the weird stuff. The, uh, the facts that it was, yeah, it was uh, weird. You know, it wasn't straight down the line. Hillbilly music was straight down the line. Fiddle music was straight down the line. The swing music. It was a little conglomeration of all of that. And what attracted you to me? <laughs> You're well, you go home if you're going by the mill, cause the bridge washed out at the bottom of the hill. Big creek, a little creek, level plow, my corn with a dirty old shovel. Hell, not living longer, dance or not, dance a little longer. Pull off the cart, throw it in the corner, don't see why you don't stand any longer. Oh, that mandolin, Johnny. Some fella wrote me from the coast that's wanting to do a movie on Bob Wills, and they had a questionnaire and one of the questions was what do you feel was the message in his music and I said the message in the, our kind of music is have a good time even though you're doing a, a love song you know or maybe some broken-hearted song they can't help but play it with a happy beat and I said and I in my notes back to him I said what kind of message is in the 
in the verse of Stay a Little Longer where it says, Sitting in the window singing to my love, and the slop bucket fell from the window up above. Mule and a grasshopper eating ice cream. The mule got sick and we laid him on the beam. Sitting in the window singing to my love, slop bucket fell from the window up above. Mule and a grasshopper eating ice cream. Mule got sick and we laid him on the beam. Stay all night, stay a little longer, dance all night, dance a little Is that a message song? It's just foolishness, but it's fun. Johnny, be good, give more.